Okay, I want to introduce the speakers first. Um, you've already heard from Mark. Um, he's the president of board NHS, of the Energy Systems uh, Integration Group and the vice president of Renewable Energy Policy at Next Era Energy Resources. He gave a really nice overview talk to lead us into the industry panel. Next up is Philip Bocage. He's a lead research scientist at Underwriters Laboratories. Um, and he'll talk about wind resource and energy assessments from a consultant's perspective. And the last speaker in this session is Greg Oxley. He's a lead data scientist at Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy, and he'll present the Digital Ventures Lab. Um, the talks are about 12 minutes long, more or less. We have time for uh, one question after each talk. And at the end of each talk, um, I hope we can have a lively, energy, uh, lively discussion with our panelists. And please type your questions in the chat window. All right, and now um, I give the floor to Philippe. All right, thank you, Carolina. Just share my screen. Let me see. There we go. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Perfect. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, so my talk, as Carolina said, it's about wind resource and energy assessment. Uh, of course, from a consultant's perspective, um, I'm Philip Bocage and I've been with UL, UL Renewables for 12 years now. Um, so let me start by showing the steps for wind resource analysis. And I really just wanna focus on the last two steps here. Um, because the purpose of the workshop is uh, challenges in atmospheric modeling for the wind industry. Um, so the first four steps are really um, about um, what we do with our, with our data, on-site data, whether it's MetMast or remote sensing devices, um, uh, to, to get them ready uh, for the uh, for characterization of the wind resource. And the last two steps here is the wind flow modeling and the energy modeling. And really the end goal of this whole process in our wind resource analysis is to get as accurate as possible with our energy production and uncertainty. Um, if you're a little bit familiar with the terminology in the industry, uh, we're looking off uh, all the time at the average energy production over a 10 or 20 year period, which is uh, what we call the P50. And then we're also very much interested in the uncertainty. Um, so think about it as two or three standard deviation. Um, so the P90s, P95 and P99s. Um, this is perhaps not news to all of you. Estimating the wind resource has always been a challenge and a high source of risk, energy risk. Uh, here you're seeing the typical uh, breakdown of the contribution to the uncertainties uh, whenever we do uh, energy production estimates. And um, it shows that wind flow modeling is typically the single largest source of uncertainty. Um, on average, we're seeing um, something around 4% uncertainty for uh, wind flow modeling is mostly onshore, but, but it varies, right? Um, and I should mention that it's difficult to reduce the overall uncertainty on the, the total energy production uh, without addressing most of these factors on the pie chart. So th there are several challenges uh, that we face in the industry for wind flow modeling. And again, I'm presenting this as a the perspective from a consultant. Uh, there might be more constraints than challenges, but let me go through them. First of all, wind flow modeling must be done at a spatial resolution of about 50 meter and over a rather large domain, um, probably something like 25 kilometer or larger in North America 
not necessarily the case in other regions, but uh, in North America, we tend to see wind plants that are on the order of 100 megawatts. Uh, if you're going offshore, it's way more or a lot more. Um, and, and we need to account even onshore for smaller projects. Uh, we need to account for neighboring wind farms, which can have impact with their downstream wakes uh, on the, the plant that we are studying. So that's why we need a, a sufficiently large domain um, and, and in Europe, for instance, in France, uh, they see much smaller wind farms, uh, typically just a few turbines, for instance. Um, so in those instances, a smaller domain of five, 10 kilometer might do the work and the wind flow modeling has less of an impact on the overall uncertainty given that it's, uh, there's not a lot of uh, uh, spatial extrapolation that must be done. Another challenge is we must we must simulate a wide range of atmospheric conditions, and we therefore use um, reduced or, or not reduced order models, but um, not the highest fidelity model. We can't include all the physics. We don't have unlimited resources, and so uh, there is some limitation with our models. And it's important to know how well they perform in certain. Uh, terrain complexity, or I should say even uh, the complexity of the meteorological conditions at the site um, to be able to choose the right model or the right settings. Um, of course, uh, we'd like to do higher fidelity models, but they require much more runtime and expertise than simple models. I don't think that's a surprise. Um, time is limited. Um, clients expect a wind resource analysis in two, three weeks. So we can't wait, you know, a week or more just for the wind flow modeling. Typically, um, our bankable energy production reports are due in about four to eight weeks. Um, by bankable, I mean uh, reports that are accepted by banks or, or other lenders. And our clients have uh, are limited in what they can spend, right? Um, currently, I'd say it's on the order of a thousand to five hundred thousand dollar for wind flow model outputs. Uh, this can change as long as we can show the gain in accuracy if we can do a cost benefit analysis. Um, but uh, here, uh, so all these constraints or considerations that I've shown in the previous slide explain a little bit uh, why we are now relying on certain types of wind flow model. And here I'm trying to show a brief history of commercial wind flow models. And I apologize if I uh, didn't represent some of uh, some wind flow models that uh, I haven't captured here in this figure. Um, but, uh, you know, going back to the end of the 1970s with mass conserving models, mid 1980s with uh, linear models such as uh, Jackson Hunt models, like WASP is a good example. We used to say that WASP is king in Europe. Um, not so much the case now, um, but uh, in North America, WASP wasn't uh, performing very well in California with the marine boundary layer advecting over the mountain pass and figuring out where the, the best wind resource was. So coupled mesoscale, microscale models became quite, um, uh, quite popular, such as site wind. Um, and uh, I'd say around the 2010, uh, CFD RANS model, Reynolds Average Navy Stokes model, became quite popular in the industry, uh, such as open foam and such. So I've shown uh, a broad range of wind flow models that are used uh, right now in the industry, uh, more or less the first, uh, the first three here. Um, I'm not trying to steer, start a debate on which one of the coupled mesoscale mass, mass consistent model or CFD RANS model is higher fidelity. Um, I just said, I'm just putting it out there, we could swap them. Um, but my point here is that there are no standards at the moment for wind flow modeling or wind resource assessment. Um, there is an IEC, uh, international standard underway for resource assessment, the IEC 61400-15, uh, which is in progress. Uh, but at the moment, the industry is relying on mostly these three models, even though um, 
you know, couple of mesoscale CFD RANs are, are available. They're just computationally intensive and LDS models are used, I believe, to do one year uh, time series, uh, 100 meters, but uh, not for a full resource assessment at, with a domain size of uh, 15, 25 kilometers, at least to my knowledge. Um, so if we want to bring those higher fidelity models, uh, the couple mesoscale CFD RANs, couple mesoscale LES, uh, to mainstream, I think we'll need to to get a better sense of uh, of the the improvement in accuracy that we're getting and the reduce the reduction in uncertainty, and this will come with a cost benefit analysis. Uh, you know, basically we want to know is it going to lead to an improvement of 10% or, or more on our wind flow modeling, or is it going to lead to just a uh, I'm I'm I, I'm being a little bit um, uh, here, but uh, you know, 0.1% improvement. So we want to know the uh, what, what we're getting into if we're going to uh, put that much effort into the flow modeling. And um, here's a quick example of uh, a validation that we've done here at UL. Um, it's uh, a validation that we've done at nine sites. It's a bit old already, but uh, it shows at least um, the 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 results are based on terrain complexity, which was the main uh, point that I was trying to show here on this slide. You're seeing the RMSE on the y-axis and the terrain complexity. Granted, we only have nine sites, so three sites per terrain complexity category. Uh, we were running a linear model, a RANS model, and a coupled mesoscale mass consistent model. Um, I, I gotta say that the RANS model that we tested at the time didn't perform uh, very well, uh, but not all mo RANS models are created equal. And we've seen over the past, uh, since 2013, uh, that um, in, in, in most cases, a lot of ca all cases, um, RANS, CFD RANS model uh, did outperform the linear models. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a point I wanted to make here. But my, my main takeaway point here is that um, the uncertainty is increasing significantly when we move from simple terrain to uh, complex terrain, even from moderate terrain to complex terrain. And I think that's uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. As I mentioned before, the average uncertainty on our on wind flow modeling is perhaps around 4%, but it can be as high as, uh, let's say, 8%. And so, uh, so we need to do a, to get a better understanding of where the errors come from. Um, terrain complexity is a start. Uh, land cover is something we typically look at too, but we need to look at uh, thermal stability, um, the different turbulence regime, um, probably uh, break it down daytime versus nighttime. Um, so how can we do better? Uh, I've already mentioned this on the previous slide that, you know, we definitely, this is the first step is understanding the model errors and where they come from. Um, we, uh, we, we are interested in running higher fidelity models, um, like coupled mesoscale CFD RANS model, although those don't have the time dimension because the RANS model is a steady state model. Um, perhaps uh, more interested or the end goal might be more to go towards a coupled mesoscale LES model. Now we're keeping a, we, we are having a dynamic model with the time dimension, but it's not straightforward to do well. And uh, a lot of uh, speakers in the coming uh, um, sessions will be talking about the different uh, uh, technical challenges related to the Terra Incognita, the spin up of the turbulence, um, the vertical coordinate system in complex terrain and so on. So in the meantime, perhaps uh, one of the option is to use high fidelity modeling to inform uh, reduced order models, uh, which is things we've done a little bit, uh, that was done a little bit for uh, wake modeling, which I have a slide coming up on wake modeling actually. Uh, looking into improved physics parameterization scheme, there's been development uh, for mesoscale model and, and, and LES, a turbulence model. Uh, P, for mesoscale model, it's more the PBL turbulence schemes. Uh, we've seen improvements in the, uh, you know, uh, since we've been running WARF over the last uh, 10 years or so. And uh, perhaps we can go just a suggestion here, but we know that uh, non-local PBL scheme perform better in unstable regimes. 
and PBL and and local PBL schemes perform better during more stable regimes. So perhaps we can have a regime switching PBL scheme or something like that. Um, I'm borrowing next point. I'm borrowing an idea from forecasting, which is to run ensemble modeling. Uh, I understand we're not to the point where we can run ensembles for with high fidelity models, but we could do it uh, with mesoscale models. Uh, I'd be interested to hear others people thoughts on this topic. I think, uh, of course, there's challenges with doing ensemble modeling. You need uh, a good number of ensemble members, perhaps around uh, 5, 10, probably more 10, and they need to be uh, quite independent from one another uh, to get the right spread. Um, and I won't talk much about advanced bias correction. Uh, I think there's a session tomorrow about machine learning and artificial tools, but just you getting, uh, of course, we want to understand better the physics first, but uh, uh, it might be uh, another way to, to, do the, to, to do a better modeling job, which is to do the bias correction with statistical methods. Um, very briefly, because I think I'm running out of time, um, I wanted to talk briefly about turbulence-induced wake modeling. Uh, again, there's no standard uh, just as for wind flow modeling for wake modeling. Uh, but most, most folks in the industry rely on engineering and or linearized RANS model, uh, such as Eddie Viscosity, for instance. Um, some, uh, there's definitely some folks in the industry who are using uh, CFD RANS, nonlinear CFD RANS model. Um, but for turbine layout optimization, uh, for sure, reduced order models will remain the norm. I, I, I say for sure, I should say, we expect reduced order models to remain the norm for the foreseeable future. Um, of course, there's some developments needed, uh, like in handling the thermal stability in wake models. Uh, I'm talking about engineering or reduced order wake models, integrating the flow and wake model together. Uh, that would be a, a nice to have. Um, my last point on this slide is to mention that wake losses tend to be much higher in offshore environments for offshore and wind farm than onshore. And so the uncertainty is also uh, quite high there too. So I think that's an area where um, high fidelity model can, can, can have a substantial impact, um, meaning especially offshore uh, for wake modeling specifically. And where do we see the wind resource uh, and energy assessment in 10 year? Um, well, first of all, reanalysis data at this rate will might reach spatial resolution on the order of 10 kilometers. So the modeling that will need to be done, um, the mesoscale modeling is going to be uh, probably below or cloud resolving uh, atmospheric modeling. Uh, of course, we'd like to see uh, higher fidelity models. Um, Mesoscale models coupled with CFD RANs or LES. Um, there's, I said, uh, mentioned that the DOE and NCAR has been working very hard on making progress and tackling the different technical issues. And hats off to, to, to all the people, the researchers working on this. Uh, just wondering how we can accelerate or improve the clock rate uh, on these uh, uh, high fidelity models and wondering if GPU accelerated WORF would be an option. Um, I've talked already about ensemble modeling, um, integrating wind flow modeling and wake modeling into a single tool would, would, be, uh, would be a great, great addition to, uh, to, to, to perform realistic and get accurate um, energy production estimate. Uh, moving to time series energy modeling, uh, so tracking all the plant loss at the turbine level and at a fine time scale. And lastly, something I haven't talked much about, but I think in the next 10 years is going to be uh, more, uh, more important and we're getting, uh, they're, they're definitely becoming a more top, a popular topic, even within the wind energy uh, conferences is the uh, climate modeling or high resolution climate problem modeling to look at the impact of climate change and climate associations on the wind resource because we're doing these energy production estimates for the next 10, 20 years. And so we need to be able to account for that. I think we, uh, that's, uh, that could become a, a source of great uncertainty or if it's actually, it's, it is already, but uh, 
yeah, more to come on that topic. So I think I'm running out of time here, but um, just the final remarks. Um, yes, we need more verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification. Um, that's a given, and that's something uh, um, th th that we want to stress out. Uh, we will need a cost-benefit analysis of running an high-fidelity model versus our current methods. And uh, we're looking to, to work at DOE to bridge the gap between the academia and the research. We think that it can be uh, very useful, uh, but it needs to be closely coordinated with the industry. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philippe. We have one quick question from Paul. How do you define wind flow modeling as a separate category from wake effects and shear extrapolation? Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, at the moment, we, it's mainly because we're using two separate tools to do both. Um, uh, in the future, we would very much like to have a single integrated tool to do the wind flow and the wake because we're we're trying to resolve the same uh, atmospheric conditions or events at the wind farm uh, it's just that for the wake modeling we're using a simplified approach where uh, at the moment uh, in most cases we we don't have the time dimension so we're using uh, sort of a steady state methods uh, so it's to answer the question briefly, it's more of a matter, a practical, oops, that's my 20 minute remark, Mark. Um, we're just trying to, uh, we were having different tools, basically, that's the only the main reason why we're separating the tools right now, the, the two right now. Thank you. Um, if you can stop sharing screen, then um, Greg, jump in. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Okay, I'll uh, share my screen. All right, are we good to go? Yes. All right. So hello, uh, my name is Greg Oxley, and uh, I'm a lead data scientist in uh, the Siemens Gamesa Digital Ventures Lab. And uh, today I'd like to give uh, uh, some thoughts about the atmospheric uh, modeling challenges that, uh, that we see from uh, specifically the, the Digital Ventures Lab perspective. So, so quite different, uh, I think, than the other two presenters' perspective. Um, so to get started, um, the Digital Ventures Lab itself is a, a relatively new group at, at Siemens Gamesa. And uh, basically this was formed in the summer of 2019. Um, I joined in February and in the past 10 months, um, we've been growing quite rapidly. So we've hired over 100 people in the last 10 months. Uh, we have a lot of uh, momentum internally and, and we have a lot of top, uh, top level support to, to get to where we need to go. Uh, so what we are is basically a, an innovation group of uh, scientists, data scientists, data engineers, data trans or digital transformation experts, etc. And basically, we're charged with the digital transformation of uh, Siemens Gamesa's onshore, offshore, and and service businesses. And what we want to do is basically combine all the do domain knowledge that we have within the Digital Ventures Lab and also in Siemens Gamesa. Uh, combine all that with, with data science and data engineering. Uh, we want to foster partnerships uh, across Siemens Gamesa and basically unleash our open innovation with, with all our talents. So open innovation is something I'll talk about a bit more in the presentation, but it's basically the new business model with, with, with how we're operating. And, and through going through this path, what we're doing is, is basically optimizing uh, all the operations and processes throughout the whole SGRE value chain. So not just uh, you know, things that are of interest to the atmospheric modeling community, but also business processes and things like that. Um, but today specifically, what I'll be talking about is our, our digital proposal manager. Um, so what this is, is, uh, is our digital product or platform that goes through the entire uh, life cycle, let's say, of putting together a proposal uh, for a, a prospective wind plant. Um, so 
once we uh, are doing this, what we're doing is we're taking all our data internally at SGRE, which is very siloed right now. Uh, we're taking all our processes and tools, and what we're doing is we're we're rewriting the tools. We're we're creating all of this new connections and databases up on the cloud, and uh, bringing it all together. And what this enables is is basically the 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 end goal of where we're we're all trying to reach. And and this is a holistic, multi-parameter, multi-objective wind farm design optimization, and allow this to through th flow through different levels of of fidelity. Let's say through all stages of the, the proposal workflow. So right from plant prospecting, where we're looking for places to invest in, in property or our customers are looking for places uh, to develop uh, power plants, uh, to conceptual design stages where we make non-binding offers that include on turbines, right down to the, the detail uh, design stage. And obviously this is a, a huge problem. And what we wanna do is be able to activate different levers in this optimization according to the proposal stage. So freeze different portions of the depend dependency graphs and optimize in different directions. So not only are we optimizing business models, our customers' business models and coming to optimal solutions through that approach, but we can go the other way as well and have uh, this type of um, optimization platform advise into a data model driven product portfolio roadmap. So be able to optimize up and down through the graph dependencies that go into everything that contributes to the cost of energy. Now, I know a lot of you are rolling your eyes and, and this is kind of a, a, the holy grail of, of what we're trying to do in this business. Um, but uh, we can see in our POCs, for example, that 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 this is achievable on on smaller, uh, let's say, sub problems of this optimization. And what we're looking to do is become as holistic as possible um, to capture all the elements that we have in this. Uh, obviously, we have tons and tons of sub models. Uh, some of these are just constants, like values in our EPC chain. Uh, we have models that are just based on historical data. Uh, we rely heavily on engineering and ML ML based models, and of course, our big heavy first principle models like uh, CFD and, and mesoscale models, et cetera. Now, this is a very, uh, very difficult problem. Obviously, it's a multimodal design space. Some of our models are discontinuous and it really precludes the use of uh, any type of gradient based method. So it becomes very heavy uh, very quickly. And pretty much to, to get to where we want to go, uh, I'd like to talk about what we need. Um, so most importantly, and something that uh, we, we don't do well in industry uh, is bringing the, uh, the mesoscale down to the micro scale. Um, I think uh, I quote someone on this call, I won't say from where, but uh, in the wind business, uh, you know, we have all these engineers and we don't know anything about real wind. Um, so I think it's very important to, to, to consider this, of course. And uh, thanks, Sue, for the nice presentation on, on the MS, MS, MMC uh, advancements. Uh, and I was really excited to see there at the end some results using some uh, machine learning parameterizations as well. As, as well. That, that really starts pointing us in the, the direction that we feel that, that we have to go. Um, but when we look uh, at what a lot of our, our R&D partners are, are looking at out in the community, a lot of it is focused on, on really high fidelity, first principle based modeling approaches. But I, I have to say, we're, we're unlikely to see any of these hi-fi approaches widely used in industry in the next five to 10 years. A few do it, a few on this call do it. Um, but having worked for a few OEMs now, I have to say there is massive pressure to not do it. And uh, as we're, we're driving down, obviously the price of wind has gone way down. We have a lot of internal cost pressure in the OEM to, to drive down our R&D budgets, to drive down our HPC resources. And I just don't see us uh, expanding our, our HPC usage really at all in the future. Uh, I started over a decade ago in this business and, and I was writing CFD RANS model at, at Vestas and, and included other layers of fidelity in that. And, and same thing at, at the next OEM. And uh, it still remains a struggle even to deploy CFD RANs uh, throughout uh, like a, a, on an OEM operational scale. Someone like Siemens Gamesa where I'm working now, we have, you know, we're looking at something like 2000 sites a year. And even to do, um, you know, CFD on, on half those sites is, is a massive struggle for us. Um, so even for the HPC resource rich, uh, let's say in, in Asia where they have access to to government research, uh, you know, HPC facilities, pretty much unlimited uses. How useful in the end is a 36 sector RANS atmospheric surface layer simulation, which everybody is running 
uh, with guest BT VCs on complex terrain anyways? And the answer is not very. So what we I see us needing to do uh, in the future, and this is something that that's always demanded of me of how we're going to get there, is uh, improved ability to estimate site and turbine specific extremes in complex terrain. And to take those hi-fi models that, that, that have been developed in the community and create meso-informed microscale surrogates so that we're able to run large ensembles of number of scenarios and uh, get to more accurate uh, both AEP and loads predictions um, you know, for our site design. This is also, uh, Peter couldn't make it today, Peter Gabrod, uh, but uh, he uh, is obviously working on our Wake Adapt product, which is uh, kind, kind of, uh, you know, AP and loads optimization, uh, where in the controller also, uh, there's obviously no ability to run uh, first principle based models. And we're really looking for more meso information in these lightweight models that we put onto controllers, for, for instance. Other things we need, uh, ML-based wake modeling. Uh, we need faster wake models, not only faster, but, but more accurate and better understanding of the mesoscale role in large array effects. We, obviously there was uh, a lot of stuff that came public last year uh, around this time where uh, I think it was Orsted had you know, massive AP over predictions uh, for, for the offshore application. And speaking of offshore, um, I, I kind of sense, and we can see that there, there's a large amount of focus, R&D focus moving towards offshore, which sure it, it's important, uh, and a big part of uh, Siemens Gamesa's business, obviously. Um, but uh, onshore is still important. And uh, I think most people would agree that, that we're nowhere close to solving uh, the problems that we have onshore. So it, uh, uh, I guess uh, we're a bit worried that uh, a lot of the, the research focus in the community won't be addressing uh, the onshore needs uh, any longer. And, uh, and it's still a, a very large need for us uh, in, the, in the wind business. Now, speaking of uh, what we need, um, I also wanted to talk a bit about uh, our, our open innovation business model. Um, so this is something that uh, we've, we've begun launching this year and working with partners this year with. Um, it's not fully open yet, um, but basically open innovation is not only just submitting a problem and asked it to be solved by a, by a group or open sourcing and using open source methods. But internally, what we're doing is defining open innovation as the antithesis of the vertical integration we see in which internal R&D contributes through the value chain of development, production and, and distribution of our products. Um, so it's a innovation process that relies on purposefully managed interorganizational uh, knowledge flows um, within an organization, massive uh, horizontal alignment, and basically an approach for better financial returns on R&D. We see our R&D budgets going down. We need to somehow find a way to do more with less, and we would like to basically work more closely with, with all these smart people uh, in the labs, in academia, etc., startups, uh, anything. We aren't picky. Um, we just want your brains. Um, so. In order to do that, um, what we are launching is basically a portal for, for open innovation uh, through the Digital Ventures Lab. Uh, and uh, what this is, is basically a, uh, a code-based platform uh, based heavily on Python, um, but basically using all open source uh, contributions that uh, we can work with academic labs and, and uh, et cetera, and government institutions, et cetera. Um, internally, we rely heavily on Mizu uh, Microsoft Azure and DevOps to do all our CI and CD activities, et cetera. But we mirror all this over on GitHub as well um, so that we can basically take uh, the code structure that we have in TVLPy and, and how that fits into our whole um, ecosystem and, and work with our partners already under this type of paradigm um, for uh, the type of multi-level optimization that we'll be doing in the future. So um, we, we, we've had this in action for a while. Most of it has been uh, centered around our site prospecting uh, work, uh, which, which obviously includes a lot of the reanalysis uh, uh, data that's out there, but also all the restrictions that go along uh, with, with prospecting. Um, so when we go to find wind farms, uh, basically we can't just look at the quantity of wind. We also have to consider the realistic ability to put a wind farm there. 
Um, so including all those restrictions, uh, we work with a lot of universities here. Uh, this is all funneling through Peter Einavoldsen at uh, Aarhus University. And uh, we have a lot of European partners. Um, we'll be working more on uh, modeling issues coming up as we're taking ownership of our, our whole cloud siting platform at uh, Siemens Gamesa. And really as a, our only North American employee in the DVL, uh, I'm really looking forward to expanding this list um, with uh, North American partners as well. Uh, it seems to be a bit Europe heavy at the moment. Um, so uh, you'll be hearing more about that. I'm sure our marketing uh, is working heavy to, to, to launch this. And uh, yeah, if get in touch, uh, thanks for listening. And uh, a lot of the open innovation type stuff uh, I'm supporting, but most of it's going through Peter Einavoldson. So his email is there. And uh, yeah, any ideas or for future collaborations, research projects, novel ideas, anything, we aren't picky. We'd love to chat and uh, yeah. So uh, that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, we have one question here from Branko. Um, how will DVL Pi be supported? Um, Worf is free, but NSF support for it is limited. Sorry, can you repeat the last part? Um, he says it, um, Worf is free, but NSF support for it is limited. So how will DVL Pi be supported? Good question. It sounds like that's one for Peter Einavoldson. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'll uh, forward that comment to him and get back to Branko. Mm -hmm. OK, so I, I got disconnected for a while. And were there any other questions before Branko or Greg? I can't see that anymore. Well, maybe not. Um, okay, so now I um, will open up um, the discussion for this industry panel and I encourage everyone to bring up any um, needs, applications or limitations that you see in atmospheric modeling in the wind energy industry that were discussed but also that weren't discussed. Is there anything else that, that you feel we should um, address here? No, are there any other questions to the panelists? I had one for Philippe. Um, he mentioned about how to of doing things better and all the suggested methods all involve more advanced models. And in the last slide, they've kind of mentioned validation and verification and surely one way of doing things better is to have more representative measurements so the models are required to do less. I just wonder if you had any thoughts or comments on that. Yeah, that's a topic that, uh, you know, we're, we're putting some thoughts into it. I mean, it's, it starts at, uh, and my colleague Dan Kirk Davidoff is going to talk a little bit about it tomorrow during the third session, I believe. It's something we already do uh, quite extensively in forecasting. And so, uh, you know, we've had different bias correction methods for a number of years and now with machine learning and artificial intelligence where as long as we have a representative long-term, long-term, more than a year of data at a site, we can show uh, some substantial improvements in our forecasting. And so I think the difficulty to apply this to resource assessment is um, usually we don't have a ton of data. We usually have, let's say one year of data at the pre-construction site. Um, we would like to use more data from other sites if we're allowed to, if we have the, the, the legal rights to, to use that to, to inform the wind flow, but the, the conditions are always a bit different. So we need a lot of measurements, not just wind speed at uh, you know a couple of heights, let's say 30, 50 and 60 meter, and then air pressure and air temperature at around two meters. We need more than that. So I think it's a maybe a bit of a chicken and the egg thing where we need more observation 
to be able to feed, uh, to get better uh, data into those machine learning and, um, and artificial intelligence tool. Um, I'm curious to hear from others in the industry if they have a different perspective on this. Thank you, Philippe. Um, we had one question from Colleen to you, and but also for, to the others. What type of LES speed up is needed for it to become really useful to the industry? What if you had a model for LES with similar features to WARF LES, but 10 times faster? Yeah, 10 times faster, we're, we're starting to get closer, I think. Um, what I said in my presentation, and of course it varies per site, uh, per project, but you know, typically we're looking at, um, at least the way we're doing it, or as far as I know, the way we do wind resource assessment and wind flow modeling, it's typically on the order of a domain size of 25 kilometer by 25 kilometer. At the moment, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's doable uh, if you, you know, given cloud computing and, and all that to run a WARF LES. Um, but, you know, we're maybe just at the cusp of calling it an LES, right? If we're running it at 100 meters, we're, we're far from, we're still pretty far from a 30 meter uh, WARF LES run or, or 50 meter, let's just put 50 meter. Um, so just if I do a back of the envelope calculation, um, if we right now we can run 100 meters, and uh, and we need to go to uh, let's say 15 kilometer, uh, if we can do uh, sorry did I say five kilometer wide and we want to go to 15, so it times three in the x direction times three in the y direction, so it's a factor of nine, and if we want to move it down from 100 meter to 50 meter, that's a factor of two in the in the time step so we're probably on the order of uh, something like a factor 18 let's say close to 20. and that doesn't include um uh, and i'll leave everyone from ncar and doe chime in but there's still some technical um, challenges with running a worth les uh, like Sue has mentioned in our talk. So there's still that too to take into account. Okay. Greg, did you want to comment on that as well? Uh, or anyone else? Um, otherwise, we'll jump to the next. So I can just take them again. So. Hello, but then it's the pack up. At least I need to take it back again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think even that. Uh, you know, 10 times speed ups, uh, we still... Oops, sorry, I was on a... Someone is not mute, muted. Can everyone mute themselves, please, if you're not speaking? Um, Roy, would you please mute? What do you think? That's an option. That's a reasonable option as well. Okay, Roy, Roy, can you please mute yourself? <laughs> Amy, can you mute Roy? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think uh, the, the original question does uh, 10 times speed up of worth LES uh, put, put us in the, uh, the ballpark of, of where we need to go. Um, from the Digital Ventures Lab perspective, uh, I guess the answer is simply no, um, but uh, certainly there would be other applications uh, for, for other people on this call, depending on what their group is doing, that that, that would be amazing, yeah. Okay. Um, so Greg, um, there's another question for you. Where do you see real-time data assimilation? Um, doesn't just need to be flow data. Going for wind plant operation in the next decade or an innovative new wind plant turbine product? Yeah, um, I'm not too, too sure where I see it going or what we're working on internally on that. Um, but certainly if, uh, if Peter were here for the Wake Adapt product, this would be very valuable. Um, uh, th that's an important area uh, for that product for sure. 
Um, and and uh, I guess also any prognostic analytic or condition monitoring type products as well. Um, but uh, we haven't moved in that area at all uh, internally. Um, for the other question from Jeff, um, if we can't do LES fast enough to to make it affordable, uh, can such models still be useful to you as basis for surrogate models? And that that's kind of, that's our idea, basically. Um, in order to get to where we want to go, uh, running in the loop, uh, first principles based model simply isn't an option. Can I follow up with um, a related question for Mark? Um, Mark, you talked about grid integration, including with solar and storage. To what extent mm -hmm. do you think having um, real time high resolution modeling would be helpful with that process as well? Yeah, the well, kind of what I was hinting at with what we're doing with plants now, where we, uh, you know, we, we have essentially real-time telemetry coming from, you know, every turbine, every plant, every inverter out there these days, uh, pretty high, pretty high resolution data. Uh, but, but certainly the, the modeling in terms of uh, certainty around what's going to happen next. And then this, you know, I think what we're really going to see is a lot of focus going toward opportunity cost as we add storage with these plants, because uh, that would change how you're going to operate right now, you know, what, what services you want to offer or what, what you want to kind of retain the capability to offer later, which is what opportunity cost essentially means is do I use it now or do I use it later? You know, what's the value to me in doing that, given that there's uncertainty in the future as well, right? So, so I think it is, you know, we're, we're in the early stages, I think, though, of really figuring out the analytics around that uh, in terms of that, how do you construct a set of offers of multiple products that you turn over to the market at the grid, for example, and then allow them to choose between these interacting options to come back with what's most valuable, right? Uh, energy versus ancillary versus reliability services and things like that. You know, the modeling is part of that, because there's uncertainty around all this, uh, you know, at, at all different time scales. So the point I was really trying to make around where I think we're going technically on projects is that it's become a goldmine for for using models, forecasts, analytics, cloud computing, you know, all this sort of stuff is going to be key to it. Uh, you know, you've been talking for many, many years, uh, Sue, about uh, you know the the value of probabilistic forecasts and ensembles, right? You know, we've been struggling to get the uh, the operators of the power systems directly use this. I'm looking for ways where we can more directly, co you know, correlate that with monetary value to the owner operator of the plant, because that's where the money is actually generated, not by just reducing the risk of, you know, the the grid operator so that they they can sleep better at night and. Uh, you know, there's, there's some value there, but it's just not as direct, you know, so I do, I do see it as a great opportunity for what, what Gregory is talking about here in terms of the analytics really becoming front and center on this. And, you know, the WinLogic's company that I was running has turned into uh, a, a sort of, you know, next their analytics now is uh, somewhat similar to, to what, uh, what Siemens is doing here. Uh, you know, I think uh, it sounds like Gregory, you're, you're doing even more on the, the use of the, the uh, modeling side on the, uh, you know, the physics-based weather models and so forth, and that's that's great to see. Thank you. Um, we are at the end of our session, um, so I would like to cut it here. But we will get back to every question, and we'll we'll save those, so they should all be answered. Um, so a big thank you to all the panelists for your valuable insights and presentations, and everyone for asking the questions. And I would like to hand it over to Sue to talk about or uh, give instructions for the breakout sessions. Okay, hey, thank you, Carolina, and all the panelists. I think this has been very informative and it's got all, it has all of us thinking, what is the future going to look like? What is the vision? And how can the folks on this call help us get there? So our, we're, we're going to be moving into breakout rooms. And the goal here is to solicit 
the vision of all our group members for the future of atmospheric modeling for wind energy. And this can span methods, technology, uses, um, platforms, et cetera. So when you come back from what is now a five minute break, you will have a chance to directly chat with these and other experts. Um, you will be automatically assigned to one of four breakout groups. So at um, 1040, when you come back, you will magically appear in a breakout room. And each breakout room uh, will have a moderator leading the conversation. We have a series of questions. Each room is going to go in a different order on the questions. And um, we really want to hear your thoughts. A rapporteur will, will display the questions on their screen and the um, moderator will solicit the input. The rapporteur will be rapidly typing that. Now, don't go away because right at 1130, you will be magically sent back into this main room. And that's a chance to hear what the other groups have been talking about, where the rapporteurs and moderators will be telling us what had happened. So if it, you come back at 1040 and you're not in one of the rooms, please send an email either to Amy DeCastro, DeCastro at ucard.edu, or myself, helped at ucard.edu. So thank you and see you in a few minutes. First principle models uh, need to be considered first. That's that's the more important driving uh, uh, thing to, to consider, and not just rely on a black box. Um, use these machine learning uh, algorithms to assist and improve your uh, first principle models. And so, with that being said, it can be very useful if used properly, being the uh, main caveat. And so, uh, when there's insufficient data for training these simple bias correction models such as linear regression can perform equally well. And so again, uh, we need more observations in order to adequately use these uh, machine learning techniques. Um, and then how am I doing on time? Okay, so I'm gonna speed through this. Um, so using machine learning to build surrogate models um, and using observations to help with model development. And then, um, I think there's a positive feedback that can happen where you have uh, increased interest in machine learning development, which increases the interest in building these large data sets that help for that, as opposed to previously data sets were collected without machine learning in mind. And sometimes you can have old data, but you can't really use it uh, with the machine learning approaches. So for uh, future HPC platforms for own versus cloud and GPUs, Real quick for the uh, the owned versus cloud, it's going to be difficult to manage these very large data sets with cloud storage. Um, and then for GPU uh, next generation accelerators, it's already in progress. There are models that are being developed, Mesoscale and LES, to use GPUs. Um, and there's new GPUs that are being designed for these sort of process, or, uh, yeah, processes as opposed to the media specific uses. Oops. And lastly, um, challenges of wind plant interactions. Uh, so um, we need the tools to model the wind farm and communication interactions. And it's something that there's legal challenges where maybe developers don't necessarily appreciate how far these uh, wakes can go and these interactions can go. So there's been observations of uh, wake recovery taking over 150 kilometers in stable conditions where offshore East Coast stable conditions are are prevalent in the uh, summertime. So it, it could be very important to, to focus on. Went a little bit over, that was a quick five minutes. It is a quick five minutes, isn't it? Um, great job, Pat. Any specific comments? Okay, let's move on to room th two. Uh, Colleen Call was leading that one and Tim Giuliano was the rapporteur. Let's hear what you, you talked about. Thanks, Sue. Uh, let me just get myself 
in order here. Okay. So the first question from or for our group was to what extent might MMC methods be applied to enable greater confidence in promoting innovative design and deployments? Um, I think uh, in general, one of the one of the big topics we were talking about is um, how observations kind of fit into the MMC goals and um, uh, research topics. Um, in general, we all agree that we will need more data in the future as uh, even as the modeling improves. Um, one thing is that we learn what measurements we will need um, to add or improve based off of our higher fidelity models so that we can inform uh, some of the lower level models. Since in many situations, the higher fidelity models are not um, able to be used, um, especially in operational uh, sense. Um, so, you know, there's not, it's not just a matter of um, about the amount of data available. Uh, there are many degrees of freedom in the system. And we have to be able to understand what's driving the system and what are the sensitivities of the complex models um, and that this is an iterative process. Um, there, we think that there is an opportunity within MMC to understand interactions between uh, the different components, for example, in a hybrid plant. Um, and so, you know, there's this complicated level of interaction between the different components that um, is currently not handled very well. And so that's something that could be uh, done better in the future, likely. Um, I've got a lot of notes here. I'm just gonna go to the next question. Um, what are the unique challenges for offshore deployment and operation? Um, I think one of the big things that we discussed was uh, blockage effects and wakes. Um, and that in general, you know, it's not, um, a, there's not a decoupling, it's, it's part of the same kind of wind uh, farm atmosphere interaction that needs to be kind of accounted for. Um, and in the context of this stable stratification in the offshore environment is really important, especially when there's low surface roughness and wakes can persist for uh, long periods of time. Um, also, you know, as we mentioned before about observations, they're just generally scarce at offshore sites. Um, and this is especially impactful for machine learning applications. And, um, you know, LIDARs, buoys, uh, things of that nature are great, um, but they're also very expensive. So um, we need to think of tools that are um, more reasonable and also just understanding their uh, uncertainty, associated uncertainty and how that uh, affects um, validation using um, MMC tools, for example, modeling tools. Um, and then the third question, we got the three questions. Um, what atmospheric processes are most important yet challenging to model? Again, blockage effects and wakes, as we mentioned. Um, offshore versus onshore extreme events because they're very different. Um, the obvious ones like hurricanes for the offshore environment. Um, but you know, the United States is uh, different from many other regions of the world in that we experience kind of a range of, of extreme events. Um, and one of the things that we talked about was ramping events and extreme turbulence events that can differ pretty drastically between the offshore and onshore environments, uh, as well as understanding regional dependencies. Um, and then we talked about low level jets and sea breezes and getting the exchange between the surface, right? Um, obviously, this is a big area of interest in terms of the, the wave uh, surface layer interactions um, and understanding energy exchanges. So that's what I've got. I did my best to distill that down. Okay, great job, Tim. Um, any other comments, thoughts from uh, room two? Okay, so uh, we'll move on to room three. Uh, Jeff Maroka moderated that room and Regis Theden was the rapporteur. So Regis and Jeff. Uh, I don't have a, a formatted uh, document to show, but I, I took some notes and I'm just put up the questions here. So the first one that we went through was what atmospheric process are most important yet challenging to model. And a lot of the discussion was around the confidence of what we are getting, and sometimes not so much about the model, but uh, how how much can we trust on the numbers that we are getting from, from our simulations? 
And another point brought up was uh, how to, that is challenging is how to manage stability in the power grids and some processes related to ramp ups and ramp downs at, at all time scales. And I think one of the, the most important point that people brought up was interaction of the of land and sea and land sea breeze and the lack of observations to to validate models and to to move forward with that. Uh, low level jets uh, can be important, but we don't really have data there. And uncertainty was another point that is challenging to know, and it's important to 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 quantify so we know we can understand better the limitations. And one last point was just uh, some microscale processes like wakes um, that can be a problem, especially for for wind farm siting. Uh, the other question that we went through was the HPC and what are the likely HPC platforms for the future. Uh, and the general thought was that we are going to the cloud and the flexibility on the resources uh, is key. Sometimes depending on the industry, depending on the company you're talking about, they, they need something small and all of a sudden they need something significantly larger. And of course, this depends on the application, but for the CFD, they think the cloud is the future. Uh, uh, the other major problem uh, brought up was data management and that all these simulations generate too much data and processing these data is a problem. Uh, disseminating the data among the community, exchanging data sets between groups uh, is a problem. Sometimes you end up needing to store in tapes and to retrieve that data can be long, can take a long time. And it's just hard to process things that are very large. And sometimes uh, it was brought up that combining many micro scale runs can be easier than one large one. So this kind of go, goes hand in hand with the requirements to, to do those runs. Uh, we went through the third question, to what extent industry require high fidelity rather than lower fidelity approaches? And the general thought was the industry does require high fidelity methods. And uh, one person mentioned that in a time frame of five to 10 years, they think it will be at a significantly higher fidelity level and that can be much more useful to industry. Uh, another general thought was that the high fidelity, even though they are needed, they are not ordinary to run. So teamwork is needed between the people that know the high fidelity and the reduced order models. And an interesting point that uh, a person brought up was that it's nice to have someone that knows both sides of high fidelity and low fidelity so that it can interpret the data together and make the, uh, the proper link between the two. Uh, one last point was that uh, for things like loads and risk of damages, the high fidelity is really necessary, but for prediction of, of something that uh, is not, something is not predictable, I'm sorry, something that is not predictable is not all that valuable. So weather prediction, just, just for knowing the weather prediction is not all that valuable as since you, if you're comparing to loads or risk that has a direct effect on you know, operations of a farm. Uh, let me move on for the last one that we tackled was offshore deployment. How do you gauge importance of coupling? And <clears throat> the main thought on this one is that the industry needs a fully coupled model, but it has problems paying for it. It's expensive and no one proved yet that those things has a direct effect. So, uh, so it was mentioned blockage effects has been shown to you know affect power production. So it's easier for you to go and get funding for that because you do have a number, you have a study, you have a campaign that proved that. And it's, that aspect is still missing for, for this ocean wave coupling. Uh, first, we need a good data set so we can quantify those things in a computational setting and then go out and, and get more funding for, for these type of work. Um, so yeah, these, these were the, the general thoughts. Thanks, Regis. Um, any other comments from Jeff or other participants from that group? Okay, we'll move on to group four. Uh, Matt Churchfield was the moderator there, and we thank David John Gagne for stepping in at the last minute. Amy DeCastro um, was evacuated due to that fire that you saw in Tim's um, background a few minutes ago. So David, John, do you have something to show us? 
Yes, uh, pulling up right now. Let's see. So uh, our, our first question in breakout room four was to, to what extent does industry require high fidelity solutions rather than lower order approaches? Uh, some of the general feedback we got is that both high and low fidelity solutions are requested, but it depends on where you are in the process of procuring and building your wind farm. So low fidelity is important early on when you don't want to like you're just kind of scoping out things initially. You need something quick that you can get get put together and get some initial estimates. But as you're starting to invest more money into the into the process, high fidelity then becomes really important, and companies are willing to spend more money to reduce uncertainty. Uh, in terms of that that uh, like the value of high fidelity, uh, one does need to demonstrate the the accuracy of the high fidelity. Uh, in terms of high resolution models and things like that. If, if it can be clearly demonstrated, the industry will pay for it. Uh, there's also another comment about um, in terms of running high fidelity offshore that if you're getting wind and wave data from separate resources or for like separate providers, uh, this can be problematic because the, the, high, the, the high wind and high wave events won't necessarily match up well. So coupled modeling is, is, is crucial for, for this component. Uh, the next question was, what are the challenges of wind plant interactions? Uh, some of the major challenges are uh, merging wakes from the single wind turbine to the full wind farm scales, uh, and also just merging multiple data sets together. Uh, there apparently are groups working on field campaigns to, to get at these, the, these issues and provide a more comprehensive picture of what's going on. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of people really like LIDAR, but it can't do everything. Uh, it can't capture turbulence. It, it's only really good for capturing the macroscopic characterization of the wake. Uh, and in terms of where lack, so lack of observations is really tricky, uh, it comes into play with both uh, loss, losses of energy from the wake and also losses of energy from the blockage of the wind farm itself. Uh, and measuring the wake behind a whole wind farm is still really difficult and we uh, still need to do more work in that area. Uh, third question was to what extent might MMC methods be applied to enable greater confidence in promoting innovative design and deployments? Uh, MMC is particularly useful to capture influence from larger scale weather systems. So, so they basically kind of add a turbulence multiplier on top of what you would get from just from the LES, such as with open cell cold fronts. Um, <coughs> as a general recommendation, MMC needs to show can add value in the like short time frame, uh, particularly in, in lowering risk from the project uh, in different ways, uh, using different metrics. Uh, MMC, uh, one recommendation is that MMC is currently too ambitious in trying to capture a full 3D wind field over a whole farm that that the, historically they've worked with much more limited data to, to, to build these things out. So why not investigate kind of intermediate solutions that are that, that deploy the high res only where it's needed. Uh, and then as computing scales up, you can use more, but uh, intermediate work would, would have a shorter payoff and maybe easier to deploy. Uh, and we didn't really get that much chance to answer the last question uh, about unique challenges for offshore deployment and operation, but this wind wave coupling data issue, data and modeling issue, uh, this certainly fits in there well. That's all I got. Thank you, David John. Um, any further comments from uh, either Matt or anybody else on that in that room? Um. I, I, th I think one thing that, that's interesting is um, there's just different, different uh, idea of, of where the beginning of high fidelity is. I mean, it's really a spectrum, um, but um, somebody said it's anything that doesn't run on a, on a desktop computer or laptop computer. Um, somebody else said high fidelity is running LES of a site for a year. So there's quite a big range. Um, and I think another interesting point was that with high fidelity data, customers don't know what to do with it necessarily. It needs to be boiled down to something simpler. And I think those are all really good points. 
it looks like all the rooms had some really fascinating conversation. And I think this last one on where high fidelity ends and also that last comment on David John's slide about are we being too ambitious with MMC going to high resolution? And one point I wanted to make there was that to use the parameterized lower order models, we need the knowledge at the high, high resolution scales so that we know whether they're right or not. We need something to compare them to. And I think that's where we see this team as fitting in, in giving that comparison data at really high fidelity, high resolution, um, so that we can build those lower order models and inform them from the higher order models. Um, I'll invite anybody else to make comments either around that or other topics. Yeah, group, this is Jeff. Maybe I'll just jump in quickly and reiterate that we discussed a similar uh, theme to what Sue just mentioned that, um, you know, we, we definitely need higher fidelity, but the problem is it's expensive and a lot of people aren't going to want to be uh, using the cloud resources or their own resources. Then there are the issues of storing the data and all of these, they just, they look like big hassles. So um, there's going to be an emphasis on extracting as much as we can out of lower order models. So we've got to think through carefully how we really make the results of the high fidelity modeling um, applicable. And, and just to follow that briefly too, it was brought up, I think, by Will Shaw that you know, if we're looking at hybrid plants where we can do a lot of balancing and integration sort of on the back end, um, are we less concerned with forecast accuracy and are we more concerned perhaps with um, features of the flow that might impact turbine um, lifespan and, and maintenance issues? So I thought that was an interesting point to bring up as well. Okay, good comment, Jeff, thank you. Another common thing that we seem to hear was getting the modeling of wakes correct and not just stopping at the turbine wakes, but really the wind farm wakes. Are they waking downstream wind farms? How does that depend on wind direction? To what extent should that be taken into account when planning wind farms? I think um, that's especially as we move offshore and start putting more wind farms in exist in regions with existing plants, um, that could be coming up more. Any other comments around that topic? Oh, yes, yeah, Sue, that's a, a topic that did come up in uh, our breakout room too. Um, we, uh, I think a point that came up is that there's still a fair amount to be done to also make our high fidelity models more truly accurate. Um, to uh, look at still work to be done on improving uh, PBL schemes. Uh, one physical phenomenon that was mentioned a lot is looking at entrainment and momentum, um, looking above sort of the turbine level itself to the upper levels of the boundary layer, but understanding how those impact the wind farm flow. Um, and also some discussion of modeling uh, stable boundary layers at high resolution and sort of the advantages of LES versus RANS there. Um, and also uh, looking at what kinds of approaches are needed to validate models. So we had a lot of talk about how we could continue to develop our modeling approaches, um, less focused on the computational cost, but more sort of on the physical modeling challenges. And it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting. It sounds like a great conversation. Anybody else? Oh, there's, there's now. Uh, go ahead, Matt. Oh, I was just going to say there. There was a little discu little discussion of, um, kind of the. There's definitely a gap between individual turbine wake um, modeling and full plant, full plant, or full farm wake models, and that bridging that gap would be useful. Mm -hmm. Bronco? 
Yeah, in our group, it was mentioned uh, the challenge of uh, demonstrating the Bake effects based on observations. That's a challenge that sometimes um, just the, the extent of Bake effects is not accepted. And then also uh, the challenges that will both stem from legal issues related to Bake effects uh, and wind shade when the projects are built next to each other. And frankly, the way leases are done in, on the East Coast, um, this is very likely to happen, especially under stable condition when the wakes are uh, the most persistent and longest. And to clarify, are you talking about farm to farm wakes in this Farm case? to farm wakes, yes. Okay, interesting, yes. Um, and you brought up data and observations for wakes. I also heard in multiple rooms talking, people talking about more observations being needed to train AI methods, as well as more trust in AI methods. I'm looking for some comments um, you know, from uh, re related to those type of topics as well. Well, the the more observations and more trust does seem to be a common theme, not just in wind ener energy, but just about everywhere else. Uh, coincidentally, I'm now part of an AI institute focused on trustworthy AI for weathering, weather and environmental science applications. So we're we're definitely looking into this area with with a lot of partners, and uh, I'm kind of curious to to hear what what kind of trust people are are interested in from the from the wind energy community, what are, are you looking more for like the physical relationships, uncertainty quantification, uh, like kind of bulk explainable guidance or individual event guidance? Uh, anyone want to jump in on that? I had heard in one of the rooms people asking for a little bit more physics guidance in the AI as being needed for trust. Could you tell us a little bit how folks are looking to include physics for such guidance? Yeah, there, there's a, a, quite a few different efforts in this area. Uh, some of them are like, there's like knowledge guided and physics guided machine learning. Uh, in, in, in these areas, uh, often the physics guidance is, is put into like the loss function of your machine learning model. So if you have some way to inform, to conserve mass or energy, you can add that to your loss in addition to uh, uh, your like mean squared error. And sometimes that can allow you to still get a good solution, but one that, that behaves with all the right physical properties. Uh, there, there's a, a other groups that are kind of looking at how you can formulate the problem uh, or, or use other kinds of models to, to look for other properties in addition to loss. So it may not be a conservation property, but maybe you, you want to uh, make sure it obeys the right spatial spectral scale or temporal uh, properties or whatever other things you care about, you can add on other machine learning models that can kind of look for this loss function, such as in a generative adversarial network framework. Uh, these have been deployed in in like high energy physics applications and astronomy, but, but there's certainly I know there's groups working on this in in the weather and climate realm too. Well, we look forward to seeing those. Um, do want to note that Neil Davis commented um, when we were talking about the waking. He said perhaps not just wakes, but in the North Sea, the offshore wind potential is also something that is being studied in detail now. And he, um, in the chat, he provided a link. Did we lose Sue? Can't hear her. Yeah, it looks like she's frozen. The last Sue, yes, for at least for a moment. Maybe but there is another comment. Video, yeah. we can increase the bandwidth. I'm not sure if that's the yeah. problem. 
maybe not. There is another comment in the chat by Jennifer Newman. In addition to stable boundary layers, it's also important to improve modeling of unstable boundary layers and how wind speeds can often drop off in the late afternoon in the southern plains. A small forecasting error in ERCOT for a summer afternoon can result in really high real-time prices. So that's the question of wind, wind ramp, uh, especially down ramp forecasting, which is a challenge. Um, so okay. and I apologize for some reason I kicked off right at noon, which is when we're supposed to kick off. Um, before we close, are there any further comments? Well, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Um, you know, we I think it's been a fascinating conversation. Really thank the panelists, everybody a hand of applause. Um, also, everybody who participated in the discussions, particularly the moderators and rapporteurs. Back here tomorrow, same time, same play, well, different address. Um, so we look forward to seeing you again as we start talking about more details of how we are uh, going to be doing our modeling and get into some breakouts on AI modeling details, as well as, um, you know, looking at downscaling. So looking forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Sue. Thank you. Bye. Bye.